We're driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search, match with Indeed. If you need to hire, you need Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. And Indeed doesn't just help you hire faster. 93% of employers agree Indeed delivers the highest quality matches compared to other job sites, according to a recent Indeed survey. One of the things I love about Indeed is it makes hiring all in one place so easy and streamlined so I can spend more time on the rest of my business. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences. So the more you use Indeed, the better it gets. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Just go to Indeed.com slash BlueWire right now and support our show by saying you heard about Indeed on this podcast. Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Welcome to Pod Maverick After Dark. I'm Kirk Henderson, joined by Josh Bow. I somehow had a multi-day absence because uh, I must be a slacker this season. But I'm joining you again after a really fantastic uh, Mavericks game. The, they just defeated the Timberwolves in what is probably their their marquee win of the season, 115 to 108. Josh, how are you doing? I'm doing good. How are you doing? The people, I just want to say before you respond to that, I know I just asked you how you're doing and now I'm talking. But just want you to know the people miss their Kirk. They demand they demand your presence after these games. So I'm glad to see your face because I don't think I can carry I, I don't think I can carry this podcast without without your takes and, and Look, your man. sultry voice. Look, man, it's a it's a special sauce. No, 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 no <laughs> podcast goes for three years without things working the right way. And we are an outstanding team when we're both coherent, which is uh, more and more difficult as we get older. But hey, here we are. Dallas Mavericks just won against the best team in the Western Conference, one of the best teams in the NBA, a 115-108 victory in a game that if you're watching it live, I'm going to be curious to read our sort of commenters reactions because we were talking about this during the game. The Mavericks felt like they were in control for so much of the game. And honestly, I felt like they should have been ahead by more. Shots weren't falling down. There were interesting miscues. And, you know, it wasn't until late in the third quarter uh, where I think it was, was it a a Tim Hardaway three and a Luka Doncic layup gave the Mavericks a nine point lead heading into the fourth where I felt, okay, okay, maybe they're, they are going to really pull away from this one. And then to start the fourth, the Mavericks had like another Benny Hill, like just comedy of errors. And they, the Wolves worked their way back into it, uh, actually take a lead. They went on a, a I think it was a 13-0 run to, to give themselves a 106-100 lead with four minutes and 55 seconds to go. And then the Dallas Mavericks played... I mean, the Wolves lost their minds. Like, that kind of can't be properly stated. I really want to – like, the the TV timeout and the the um, the use it or lose it timeouts that both coaches used absolutely destroyed the Minnesota momentum. Um, and then the Mavericks, they, they held the Wolves in the final five minutes of regulation. Okay, final four minutes and 55 seconds. 
the the Wolves scored two points, two and those, meaningful points. And those two points came when the game was pretty much over. Mm-hmm. Um, like it was, I think Edwards got a dunk when the Mavs were up like six with like fifteen seconds left. So I mean, yeah. like, <laughs> that's pretty crazy. Yeah, uh, yeah, you're right. We talked about that in Slack. I felt like the Mavericks were going to win this game. I mean, it just felt like they were going to win from pretty early on. And I know the fourth quarter made things pretty harrowing and maybe complicated things more than it should have. But the Wolves offense kind of stinks. Um, looks like on cleaning the glass, they're 16th in offense. Last two weeks, entering tonight, last two weeks, they were 20th in offense. And I know that they've beaten the Mavericks twice, um, but the second game was without uh, Luka and Kyrie, and the Mavericks still kept it close all the way to the end of the fourth quarter. Um, something about playing this Minnesota team, like, and it's not just this Minnesota team. Just whenever the Mavericks play a team that is not a good a, above average offensive team, it feels like they have a chance because their mm-hmm. offense is good enough that if they're finding their groove and they're doing what they should do and Luca and Kyrie look like the all NBA shot making gods that they are, it kind of cancels out all the Mavericks warts in a, in a weird way, at least within the regular season playoffs is, is a completely different story, but like in the regular season, if the Mavericks are going against a good team, you know, for me, it's like, okay, does that good team? Are they good because they're a good defensive team or an offensive team? And the wolves are, you know, they're the best defensive team in the league. Uh, but they they struggle to score, and you felt that throughout this game that the Mavericks' defense was just not tested as hard as maybe when they're playing against a sure. City or they're playing against a Denver. It's just different, and especially with the way the Mavericks defend. Like we feel like some of their guys are a little bit better in one-on-one situations. It's the off-ball stuff that really kills them, and transition really kills them. The Wolves aren't running in transition, and their off-ball stuff is whatever. Uh, you know, it's a lot of Anthony Edwards and, and garbage points in the paint. Uh, and really, it was often, you know, the offensive rebounds was maybe the, the, the main reason they were in this game. So, yeah, the Mavericks can't guard Anthony Edwards. Not really a lot of other people can. But you look at the rest of their roster, and it's like, oh, um, there's just not as many threats as you think. Um, so, I, I don't know. It just, I felt like the Mavericks kind of took care of business. I thought their offensive, I thought Luke and Kyrie were incredible. Um, well, let's let's be fair here. Yeah. Because I, I think he deserves his flowers because I think we've sort of had the specter of criticizing Kyrie for most of this season. That was a sublime basketball performance from him. That's probably um, his best game of the season. Yeah, and maybe as in a Mavericks uniform, though there, there were a couple last year that were pretty damn amazing. I wrote in the recap that that game is why you go get Kyrie Irving. Mm-hmm. That's the argument because Luka... Finished with a nice line, but Luca's game was weird, um, and and obviously imperative to why they won. Make make no mistake, I'm not criticizing Luca at all. I thought his defensive effort was really kind of outstanding for Luca, um, but the offense from Kyrie was just. I mean, we we've watched three games in a row of him looking like an artist. And granted, when you play the Portland Trailblazers, you kind of want to roll your eyes at elements of what you're doing, but his three point shooting. His quick trigger on those threes, I really like. He's too good of a shooter to pass up some of these threes that he's been doing in the offense. I know. And it's just beautiful to watch his set shot where he catches it off, you know, the pass or a chest pass right in the shooting pocket. I really just love watching him shoot the basketball in that way. Uh, And, you know, to read his line, 35 points on 14 of 27 shooting. Uh, He only took one free throw, which is ridiculous. He was six of eight from the three-point line. He had eight rebounds, including five on the offensive end. (laughs) Five assists, three steals, two blocks. For a 6'1", 170-pound guard, and I know people will probably argue with me on the measurables, don't care, he's small. That's fucking amazing. I loved it. Yeah, and it was such a shame when he got hurt because he he started the season pretty slow because he had – the multitude of injuries that he was dealing with in the preseason. And then somewhere around mid-November, he had he had a stretch like from November 12th, basically till he got hurt, um, where he was, you know, routinely like at you know, he was averaging like 25 or more per game and he was starting to shoot the three better. Then he got hurt and he's gone and he comes back and that that loss against the Jazz, his first game back, he looked really he looks like a guy that hadn't played in a month. And you're just kind of like, oh, our injury is just going to zap him because is he going to be on that constant train of 
working his way back, coming back and being rusty and then missing more games by the time he gets into a groove. Kind of like what KP, Christoph Przingis was doing like his yeah. his last, se- last season or two with the Mavericks. Like just that constant strain of going in and out of the lineup and re- revving yourself up and rehab and all that stuff. It just takes its toll. So it was really nice. Like the last three games he's been amazing. Like he's been terrific. Um, his, his production almost looks a little modest because – he hasn't had to play the fourth quarter of the previous two games before this right. Wolves one. So, like, you look at 24 and 29, you're like, oh, that's pretty good for Kyrie. But it's like he could have had 40 if that if, if they needed him to in those those two uh, Portland games. So, to see him continue that against a team that's really good, um, like the Wolves, uh, and defensively is very good, uh, was fun to see. Funny enough, Kyrie kind of feels like the perfect player to break this Wolves defense and this Wolves defense is so good and why they're so good is because they're big and they're long and you know Rudy Gobert is a defensive player of the year candidate Jaden McDaniels is a huge Swiss army knife guy and and Towns is not a great defender but when he's not the sole rim protector like he's he's a big dude like just having his arms out there Anthony Edwards is a big guy as well but they don't have a lot of point of attack defenders like you look like you know Conley's okay but he's older and he's well, small and Jay McDaniels is okay, but you want him on a, on a wing. Like he's just too big usually. And like Kyrie's ability, you know, not only to attack from, from the point of attack, like they just didn't have a good one-on-one matchup, but also he doesn't need to get and score at the rim at will to be successful or go he to the doesn't. He bunch. takes a lot of tough mid range yeah. foot stuff. Yeah. Which is what the wolves will give you. And funny mm-hmm. enough, I, uh, I've got it. Oh my gosh. I just had it. <laughs> the Mavericks shot six of 11 for mid range, which okay. is like really good. And that's, you know, you look at that and you're like, oh, well, that's pretty lucky. But it's like, no, I mean, that's Ky- like, that's Kyrie. That's like Luca. They, those players shooting those shots uh, is a good thing. And I think, yeah, okay, Gobert's going to wall off the rim. Kyrie, like, if you wall off the rim against Kyrie, that's like, you're not, that's not like the number one way to stop him. You know what I mean? Like, he's totally fine pulling up, living in the mid-range, hitting threes and stuff like that. So I felt like he's a good advantage against this specific Wolves defense, uh, mm-hmm. just the way they're set up. Mm-hmm. Um, I just, you know, it's one of these contests where you go into it, and the Mavericks are still so flipping size deficient. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it You kind of come prepared to talk about this game where it's like, all right, this is just a game where the Mavericks got beat. You know, Rudy Gobert had four offensive boards in the first quarter, and it was just <laughs> gonna be—it was just gonna yeah. be one of those games. He um, finished with six. He finished with six, which meant <laughs> the team effort that went into this. And so you, you're talking about pointed attack, like defensive stuff with the Wolves. Again, we try not to be refs, guys, but what the Wolves do, and what a lot of good defenses over the last several years have done. The twenty, uh, the bubble Lakers are a great example of this is they essentially foul the shit out of you on every play and demand that the you know refs call everything. Tonight, Edwards, Towns, and Gobert got called for stuff that they seemed baffled by. Mm-hmm. And there are going to be nights like that because they're just a big physical team. And the Mavericks, honestly, just to be quite candid, did not necessarily take advantage of the fact that the Wolves were in foul trouble. They rarely held the lead past four or six points. Um, And there were opportunities, particularly with the kind of shots that Tim Hardaway got and just missed. Uh, Grant Williams missed a lot of open shots. You know, it felt like they did. They cut Josh Green out of the rotation in the second half. No, he still played 31 minutes. Um, yeah, Josh Green didn't shoot (laughs) shots. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's like, you know, Seth Curry was 0 for 3 and had some great looks. Um, Mm -hmm. It just th- there were opportunities, I think, for the Mavericks to really actually go up big on the Wolves. And it just never happened, and and so that's why this win sort of feels even more important. You know, I'm looking at the the, the three point shooting numbers. The Mavericks were 37.5 from the four, 15 of 40, but you know it was Luca and Kyrie who hit uh thir- or I'm sorry, 11 of 20, and so everybody else on the team sort of struggled with the open looks that they have, and that's not necessarily always going to be the case. Um, it was it's just a really you know, they, they Mavericks missed a lot of free throws. This was just one of these games which I was worried they were going to sort of drop away, and instead they pulled through in just such an impressive performance. Uh, the wolf, I, I do think the Wolves self destructed a little bit, but you know, you, it takes two to tango. And I, was, I, I find myself leaving this game as as positive a feeling about this Mavericks as I have been in a long time. 
Yeah, I mean, this is a game last season. They pro- once the Wolves take that six point lead, they probably lose, right? If this was last season's team, um, so that's a good sign, you know. Not yeah. only having Kyrie and Luca play well in the clutch, you know, which is nice. Kyrie hit those two threes when they were down, um, which felt like kind of those. I mean, those were huge, huge, huge shots. Um, and, but not only that. It, you know, you were starting to get a little nervous because it felt like everyone besides Kyrie and Luca was missing all of their shots in the fourth quarter. And you're like, oh man, here we go again. And then Derek Jones Jr. has that awesome dunk that basically was the the cincher the, the, that sealed it, which is something you don't, you know, Kirk, when was the last time you saw a Mavs role player get a driving game ceiling dunk against a really good team and you're gonna probably struggle to find an answer ever (laughs) i mean and and the thing about that a lot of of the mass fandom have kind of rightfully said why isn't jones being used in that rim and that sort of um what do you want to call it release valve point at the free throw line extended area more often for double teams yeah. I think the reason you don't use it as often as we might like is because you sort of want to save it because the Wolves looked – they were not prepared for that at all. <laughs> no. Um, and Powell and, set and, a nice screen in the paint, like uh, kind of on Gobert, so Gobert couldn't even help. Like it was it was really good, like everyone doing the little things right to make it work. Sure. And you have all these different options where mm-hmm. right now I feel like the Mavericks can throw three or four different guys in that sort of role man spot and get interesting results. So – yeah, and plus Jones, you know, Jones became kind of a rim runner because, I mean, the teams he was playing on, he was like playing backup five and like, you know, now that he's starting, he's, you know, I know Lively wasn't playing, but like it's kind of hard for him to be a rim runner when he's playing next to Derek Lively. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. like that makes it tough. So maybe when you do some bench units when he's on and Lively's off, you can do a little bit more of that. But yeah, know. it does make I'll- it, you know, he kind of has to space a little bit more if, if he's playing next to a traditional center. Call me a sicko, but let's put Jones in that middle spot and maybe put uh, um, Derek Lively in the in the dunker spot or in the corner every now and again, just to really baffle teams. Like I, I want to see like some true sicko mode stuff because number one, I want to see Derek Lively shoot a three just because I heard about it so much during the draft process. Still have yet to see it in the game, I think, and also just because I think he would be a terror coming from the weak side because they did they used KP that way a few times where he would often roll from like the weak side in for a jam, and it's just uh, I just I need to see it. Um, okay, let me shill for a second, guys. There's great number of people in here. Uh, if you haven't subscribed to the show, would really love it if you could go, the, go down to to you know, within the stream here, click the like button. Go ahead and click subscribe to this show. Josh and I, one of us, is recording almost every show. Uh, this season, I've, I've also been doing less of my uh, fan interaction shows where you guys can come up here and talk with Josh and I. Uh, I'm going to be doing one of those tonight, even though I didn't broadcast it, um, just because I didn't know how I would be how, how I would be feeling at a given time. But in early game, you know, Sunday night, we're gonna we're gonna have a great time. So stay around, stick around. We'll try to do like a 30 minute show where you guys can come up and talk basketball with me. Uh, kind of as quickly as possible and we'll we'll have some fun but i really appreciate you guys appreciate your guys um show support i know there might be a few people out there who listen to apple uh still we're very close to getting this apple issue solved it is not our fault it is absolutely killing josh and i that we haven't fixed it but here we are two stories remain as unbeatens collide for the title gonna get any more dramatic Jim Harbaugh and the Wolverines are looking to finish the mission, while Michael Penix Jr. and the Huskies hope to write their perfect ending. The final chapter, and the stakes couldn't be higher. A new playoff champion will be crowned. The College Football Playoff National Championship. Number one Michigan versus number two Washington. Monday at 7.30 Eastern on ESPN. Okay. Uh, thanks so much for, for sticking with me on that. I want to. I have a little bit of a riff that I, I need to get off my chest here that I've been thinking Uh-oh. about the last couple of days. Not a big deal, but it's just I did it a little bit the last time I was on, and I'm doing it in here tonight where it's like I'm watching some of the comments, I'm watching some of the Twitter replies that I'm getting, and like, guys, I just I can't implore you to enough. If your first reaction to this game is to go, well, we still don't have enough size. Well, this is a problem, and this player is not very good. Take a deep breath. Take a lap and enjoy the fucking victory. I'm sorry. This was an awesome game. I feel like if you're saying this, that yes. it's gotten bad. <laughs> I am an asshole who cannot help but see the dark and stuff. It is where I live. It is how my brain functions. 
And unfortunately, what I'm seeing is more and more of that. And I don't want that for fans. I don't like telling people how to fan. I do that sometimes and it's very not okay. We've seen different people in the Mavs organization tell us how to do that over the years and it drives me nuts. But I'm just telling you guys, the victories don't come often enough in life. You need to enjoy it a little bit. There are going to be times when we come in here and we fucking hate watching basketball. Tonight is not one of those nights. This was an awesome win. It was a great time. And I don't really want to hear how Kyrie Irving doesn't fit. I don't really want to hear how Josh Green isn't an NBA player. I don't want to hear this stuff. They just beat the best team in the West. Enjoy it. Who, who, was anyone in your mentions talking about Kyrie? uh, Yeah, I mean, I get, no, I I mean, there's a couple people in our comments here and I get, you know, I get, I get direct messages all the time. (laughs) It it just, it happens where I'm just like, tonight, (laughs) come on, they don't win this game if they don't have Kyrie. Lighten up, Francis. This is the game. Like, this is the blueprint, right? I would rather be lucky than good. I'm sorry. I just would. And if you want to attribute elements of this game to luck, fine. I, we suffered through last year and it fucking sucked. And I know I'm cursing too much. So I get some messages where people tell me to curse, but I <laughs> use the, I use the F word. Like it's salt and pepper and in, in a meal. It's just, it's too often. Um, and, and no, but so I have some people saying, oh, you know, I get a lot of DMS. I get a lot of messages. It's just that, that sentiment is out there where it's just like, ah, oh, we still need to do more. I don't disagree that this Mavericks team has a ways to go. And there are deficiencies in the roster. I'm just saying, let's enjoy the ride a little bit just a little bit if i'm the you know that's all that's all sorry too much i'm with you i'm with you and and i wonder (laughs) i feel bad uh i tweeted this uh last week so last season um the mavericks on january 2nd were 22 and 16 and the mavericks right now are currently 22 and 15 (laughs) So I wonder if that has spooked people into being like, oh, God, like, like if the Mavericks lose their next game, they're going to have the exact same record at the same point of the season as they did last season. I Absolutely wonder if people, hilarious. People are going to get PTSD. Like, Absolutely uh, so, hilarious. <laughs> so I wonder, I, I feel bad. I wonder if people are. No, but that. at this point last year, the Mavericks looked teetering. Because Luka, Luka, you know, he just averaged for the month of December, Luka Doncic averaged 38, 8, and 11. Uh, I think maybe even 12. Luca averaged during that seven game win streak something like 45, 10, and 12. And they needed that against some of the worst teams in the league. That's all. Yeah, they, yeah, they were only 22 and 16 because they played seven in a row against like non playoff teams. Yeah. For the most part. Yeah. Right. So we'll see. Um, but yeah, I'm with you, man. I mean, that was a fun game. Um, I this mean, was the only- win. They have four more wins. And they have, sorry, they have four more games in this home stretch against challenging teams: Memphis, New York, New Orleans, New Orleans. None of those are guaranteed. This was the one. This was the defining win of this stretch. Where if they get that, so they're three and zero in this home stand, three and zero on a on a like a win streak, and so it's just something to build off of. And they did it with Luca looking a little. The the wolves give him problems, and I I I want to. Should we kind of talk about why? What can you kind of walk yeah. us through? What is what do they do to make life hard for him? Well, they have they just have so much length. Um, and with Luca, I mean, he loves to pick out the weak link, and with the wolves, it's just it's like it's hard to pick out the weak link because everyone mm-hmm. on their team is so big. I mean, you you would think it would be like Conley. But I don't think the Wolves switch a lot. Like I didn't see them. I, I didn't see them switch a lot. They play a lot of drop with Gobert. Um, so he really has to make a lot of jumpers to to be good. And you know, with Luca, his jumper can kind of either be. Like I think an he, all or nothing t- he doesn't want to take a jumper though. No, no, I know, I know. And he, I just kind of think he should. Like it, 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 he he tried some like twelve foot floaters, and sometimes that game's incredible for him. But he was really like the two point shots tonight looked hard to come. They they were they were not easy to come by. No, but he ended up, you know, taking three mid-range shots, made two of them, which was good. He made four of nine above the break uh, threes. He took three corner threes tonight, by the way, which I don't know. I would have to look that up. I don't know if he's ever taken three corner threes in one game um, because he kind of, I mean, he opened the Did game. Did he hit pretty, any of them? He hit one, one of three. Okay. Um, yeah. He opened the game pretty passive. Ooh. Like he let Kyrie kind of. Which is good. Wait, yeah. No, that is good. I'm not. That's not a criticism at all. Um, the only thing is, you know, I wish 
they would make better use of him when he's off the ball instead of him just kind of standing, you know, in the corner or whatever. But that's 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 a, a conversation to have after a different game, not this one. Um, but yeah, like you know, I mean, Gobert's great at the rim. Uh, they've got you know Jay McDaniels, who's a really good wing defensive player. Anthony Edwards, when he's like on ball and locked in, is like a terminator. Mm-hmm. I mean, did he had that that uh, steal of Luca? I think was in the third or fourth Luka quarter. Luca does like, not get picked off like no, that. no. Ooh, yeah, he... yeah, that was not like you just don't see that happen to Luca all the time. So yeah, they've just got you know they demand you to take you know maybe shots you're not comfortable with the Wolves. Like they play the percentages, and they've also got the defenders to kind of force you into the shots that you don't want to take. Uh, and so, you know, with Luca, who's so used to just being like, I get to do whatever, like, you know, defense be damned. I kind of impose my will on the game to go against the defense. That's so good. That makes him maybe do some stuff that he's not used to doing. They don't switch a lot. Um, so that makes it, I just think it makes it a little tougher. And we say all that. And he had 30, what did he have? 34 on 26 shots. Like he made almost half of his threes. Like he still ended up figuring it out. He only had three turnovers, eight assists. Like, it's just hilarious how. But we were watching this game. We're like, man, Luca just doesn't look like Luca. And it's oh, he still had an All NBA line, and he was still pretty efficient, which I think just goes to show how good he is. Really, something. Uh look like kid. So I got an interesting comment, and I don't know what. To, I, I just sort of want to throw it out to the to the chat and to everybody for for thoughts. Uh, with you know, you got injuries to. Um, Derek Lively, you have injuries to our guy. Um, what's wrong with me? Who's Exum. Exum, sorry. Ugh. Uh, injury to Exum. So you're down two players. So you kind of got to run a short rotation. Yep. Do we think, do we think there's anything to the fact that, that the Mavericks may sort of need to shorten their rotation to about eight guys? Like, is, is that a thought or is that just me kind of casting out into the wind? Well, let's say Lively and Exum are healthy. They played basically like seven guys tonight. You had two more that could see the nine. Uh, I don't know. Like, is there someone when Lively and Exum are back that played tonight that shouldn't be playing? I know Mavs fans are going to say Dwight Powell, but I don't know. He's doing his job. <laughs> He's doing his job for the most part. Like, um, like is, is, is Grant? <laughs> oh, is <laughs> Just say it if you like. You, I don't know because like you're I trying to lead me into into no, saying it. No, I honestly it. don't know because like the Grant stuff is so weird. He, he he. I didn't think he necessarily played a bad game. It's just I feel I'm I'm really zeroing in on his mistakes at this point because I just need him to hit an open three. His shots are so wide open, they and are. you know he just can't hit. Now he he he, he did that great drive left handed layup in the I think it was fourth quarter. It might have been third yep. quarter. And then he just proceeded to clang a three, and it's like, oh my god, it's it's really it's. <laughs> I, I just, have two I blocks, it. which yeah. was nice. Like, I think it's just. I mean, it's disappointing that he's now a bench guy, and it's disappointing that like, you know, they play. He didn't play in one of the Portland games, but like the previous two games before this one, they play Portland and they play Utah, which are two you know non playoff teams, and he had six total points combined. Like, just you know, he's he's just he's. In a fun, I don't know, like, it, I keep waiting for him to just, like, have a game where he makes, like, five three-pointers because they're so open. The last time it happened was against the Lakers. Yeah. I don't know. So, it's yeah. been a while. And then he made four, and it was against the Spurs, and that was oh, before yeah. Christmas. So, I don't know. Now that he's coming off the bench, it doesn't feel as impactful. Like, you know, because he was starting before sure. and playing, you know, 32, 34 minutes. I mean, if they're – if they've – I think the, the fear was because he was their kind of marquee off-season move – was like, are they going to be able to to reduce his role? Because it was pretty clear the way he was playing that they needed to change something up. So, I mean, he played 20 minutes. He didn't play 30. You know, it's still a mystery that he can't make some of these shots that he's making and, and his defense seems to be really up and down. So, I mean, they're going to need him to play. I mean, he's playing backup center now. I mean, when, I mean, I don't think when Lively comes back, they're going to just face him out. Because uh, he's just important. No, but, you're probably right. I don't know. I'm sort of. I feel thinking. like now that he's off the bench, that's like that takes away a big, maybe chunk of the frustration watching him play. Because if he's not closing games, he's not starting games. Like, I feel like that's kind of like the best compromise you can get while he's playing poorly. Because uh, I just don't feel like he's going to be someone you just take out of the rotation completely. 
So in our Slack, you had kind of an interesting comment that I want to flesh out a little bit more because I, oh, okay. I you, you said that during the game, you're like, sometimes it's really funny watching the Mavericks on defense when Luka and Kyrie are both on the floor because it feels like neither of them are actually guarding a particular person. Could you walk me through that a little more? Oh, uh, it was a possession in the first quarter. And to be fair, they got better about this as the game went on. Oh, gosh, I need to find the possession. No, it's okay. But yeah, it I mean, was can a you possession. describe what you mean like when you say that? Yeah, it's just they're hovering off ball and they're not guarding anyone. And they're not, you know, it's not one of those things where they're like shading or helping. It's like they're deli- they're legitimately just kind of standing still while players are just like moving around them freely and getting open. Uh, and I think someone scored a layup on, on that possession. But yeah, it was a possession where the ball was on one side, Luke and Kyrie are on the weak side. And they're literally just kind of standing. It's almost like they're playing zone, which I know they're not because right. no one else is. And it's just, you know, they're just space cadetting on the weak side of the floor and the Minnesota did something. I can't remember what it was, but they got like a layup or they got a score or an open. Th- I can't remember what it was specifically, but it was just funny because I was like, boy, that's like, that's not good. Like, it's very not good uh, to have that when your two best players are, are doing the defensive end. But to be fair, I didn't really see much of that past that possession, but it does give you a little slap in the face reminder where it's like, okay, if your two best players are Luca and Kyrie, there are going to be moments because they're not exceptional defenders. Sure. Every possession like that's going to happen. So I don't know. It just it was just funny to watch. Uh, and I was a little worried because it happened in the first quarter. I was like, if this keeps happening, this is going to be a bad loss. Um, so but they cleaned it up, to be fair. They cleaned it up. Um, also helps that <laughs> Jaden McDaniels, who Luca was guarding a lot, um, <laughs> like got monstered of all of his offensive talents tonight, I think. Like, yeah, that dude could not buy a shot. Um, even if he wanted to. And he scored 16 points in his last game. Um, so it was just, he he had a particularly rough night. So he could even make him pay if Luca was sleeping on the defensive end. But yeah, that's all. I mean, it's just, you know. So get, you know. That leads me into my next question. Okay. My eyes were telling me that Luka Doncic challenged three-point shots harder than I've ever seen him mm-hmm. challenge three-point shots in my life. Is, yeah. is, is that a real thing? Did that happen tonight or am I just nuts? No, I think so. Like I said, I think after the first quarter, I thought they were a little bit better. They were way better um, being attentive off the ball and rotating and making the rotations. I mean, the Wolves shot 31% from three. McDaniels was 0 of 5. Reed was 1 of 4. Um, they also like, I feel like they let the people that should shoot three shoot. Like, you probably want McDaniels shooting, even if. McLaughlin, though, is pretty good. And they were, he, I mean, he was two of seven from three. I feel like he torched the Mavericks in a previous outing. I think he did. At, I'm going to go look at his box scores. Well, Reed, I mean, remember in the first game they played this season, the Wolves and the Mavs, Reed made what, like seven threes? Yes. Uh, and he only yeah. made one. So, I mean, I don't know how much of that was a defensive adjustment or, or luck. Um, but that was huge. I mean, that's a, that, that's, I mean, Reed was not kind wrong. of a, a non. I'm, I mean, I'm he not McLaughlin. Sorry, there you are. Yeah. You might be thinking of that other guy. He's not on the Wolves anymore. Um, that people wanted uh, the Mavericks to sign. No, Noel or no, whatever his name is. Sure. He's on. He's on yeah. Memphis now. Um, but yeah, that was a big difference. Like Reed kind of did what he wanted uh, at the rim. He drove by Josh Green from the three point line, and I was kind of like. What's going on there? That was kind of weird. Takes, Reed take. I I was uh, I coach a seven year olds basketball team today, and we got beat twenty four to four yesterday. <laughs> and so the coach and I decided to really attempt to like show these seven year olds like what does like what is defense? And it's like the basic rule is do your best to stay between the ball and the basket. And every now and again, Josh Green does this thing where he sidles someone at twenty seven feet. And he's like, you should go to the rim. And I'm just like, I lose my mind at that. Now, I know that's because he's overplaying a particular hand, but it's like when you overplay a guy that hard, he's going to use the weak hand. You're just giving him a path to the basket. And Josh isn't big enough to do that sort of thing. Anyway, just sort of a thought I had in my head. Um, (laughs) Jared Sullivan says 24 to 4 sack the coach. (laughs) You're right. You're not wrong, man. Um, All right. Is there there kind of anything else we, we need to hit on here? Um, we need to talk about the Mavericks having eight blocks, I think for the third consecutive game Ooh. as a team. Um, they also had seven steals. So 15 stocks they had pretty talk good. about this with our man, Matt uh, Martinez last Portland game. I think in the two Portland games, they had 36 combined steals and blocks in those two games. And now they had 15 in this game. So 
they are making defensive splash plays in a way that they were not doing in the first month or two of the season, which makes a difference. Sure. Um, Jones had three blocks. Uh, it's funny. None of their, I mean, Powell had zero, not to pick on him, but like all their blocks came from like Josh Green had one, Kyrie had two, Jones had three, Grant Williams had two. Jones had t- three and he, his block rate, block percentage, he's at about three. He's right above He's right even at three heading into this game, so it probably went up a little bit tonight. Um, For his career, his block rate is 3.2, which is, like, really high for a non-center or a non – you know, he's been basically playing three and some four for most of his career. So um, I think for for reference sake, like when Maxi Kleba was a little younger and and Spryer – his block rate was like usually between three and a half and four. Uh, and that was when Maxi used to block shots all the time. So that might've been something like, I remember looking at that when they signed him and being like, Hmm, that's interesting, but he just never played enough minutes that I felt like for it to like, really like, it's like, okay, is that real? Because he's always been a part-time player for the most part. He's, he's never really been a full-time starter for a full, you know, I think the most games he started in one season was 43 um so he's always mostly been a been a bench role guy and so it was one of those things where it's like well if he's actually starting like the mavericks are starting him now and it's like you're seeing the effects of him playing more minutes like he's he's blocking a lot of shots for for a perimeter based player so that's that's a new dimension that the mavericks have uh, that they've they haven't had in the past that's nice that's nice i i, I you know just to, to... Before we sort of round out and head on to the next show, I think it's, it, I want to circle back to my point a little bit, not only about, you know, kind of enjoying the wins. The Mavericks still have places to go. When mm-hmm. they, they're, you know, my, my friend Seth Part now, uh, he is a, a former uh, Milwaukee Bucks staffer. He works for an analytics company. He is one of the smartest people in the basketball world. He just asked me, are the Dallas Mavericks good or what? And he's being <laughs> a little tongue in cheek here. I think that question is worth talking about in the sense of the Mavericks have not played their ideal lineups at all because everybody's hurt. You got guys hurt all the time and yet they're 22 and and what uh, 15. So, you know, you, you could argue they were playing what they thought was their ideal lineup to start the year when everybody was healthy, when Grant Williams is absolutely on fire. But then as the season goes on and Williams kind of peters out, they had to find Dante Exum. They had to find different solutions, right? Josh right. Green's been hurt. Luka Doncic has been hurt. Kyrie Irving has been hurt. Derek Lively has been hurt. Dante Exum has been hurt. Grant Williams has been hurt. Maxi Kleba is still hurt. So this notion that they're capped out and like, oh, we got to figure, we got to find this out. I, I don't believe they're in a rush to make a change because they're winning anyway. And I just think that's a value when you think about what they still have to come back to. They are not the most unhealthy team in the league by any stretch, but the key people in your seven, in your top seven, I think the Mavericks have gone without one of those guys a lot the last 25 games. And that matters. Yeah. And I was saying it was, then they're not, they're not all getting hurt at the same time. Like Kyrie is misses a month and he comes back and literally his first game back, Exum gets hurt and then lively gets hurt the next game. So like, it's not, you know, it'd be one thing if these guys were all hurt and missing all the time together and then they come back. Like it, it feels like it's just one after another with these injury stints. So like you said, like they just, you know, I, I'll look it up right now. Uh, I'm trying to figure out, I don't think Luca, Kyrie, Exum, Jones, and Lively, which I think everyone would agree at this moment is probably their best five um, that they can put on the floor right now. I don't think that they've played more than like 30 possessions uh, total as a team, uh, as a fivesome. That's right. Um, because again, Exum started the season, not really in the rotation and mm-hmm. he explodes when Kyrie gets hurt. So, and then he comes, you know, we, you know, and as soon as Kyrie gets back, he gets hurt. Um, so they just haven't had a chance to, to get that a look at those five together. And when those five did play together, I think most of those, those possessions that they played were, at the beginning of the season before, like, I think anyone had really figured out um, or Exum had figured out, you know, kind of what kind of player he was. Hold on, I'm filtering it out right now. Love yeah, they've, play- they've played 56 possessions together this season. For a reference, there's usually between, like, 95 to 100 possessions in a single NBA game. So they've basically played a half of basketball together. 
if you want to look at it that way, which is not that's nothing. That's, and that's, that's what nothing. I'm talking about. Where I'm just like everyone's like, we gotta fix this. The a friend of mine, Jared Dubin, uh, occasional contributor to 538.com, also writes a nightly basketball newsletter called Last Night in Basketball. Has a phrase he uses with me called a solution in search of a problem. When you're seven games over over 500, it's just hard to tell me that this team isn't what you want. Like, sorry, I, I, I'm not going to, I don't mean to be disrespectful of people's feelings and thoughts. Occasionally I am, but it's just like, this is the sort of thing that I really want. Just really want everybody to settle down a little bit. Yeah, really I want them to settle down. But also I don't blame people for being like, wow, if they traded for a all-star caliber power forward right now, you're like, are, are they title content? Like, or does that jump them from middle of the pack in the West to like one of the top two teams uh, because they're playing so well as is. I kind of also understand, you know, that desire as well, but you're right. Like they really need to see what they look like um, with those five. And unfortunately they've only got about, you know, I don't know how long it's going to take trade deadlines in about a month. So uh, it's going to be really interesting to see what they do. um, If they feel like they should stand pat and see what they have with the injuries or if they feel like, man, we're, close let's do something um, they might have that decision taken away from them though because i don't know if they have enough to even do something if they want to do something uh so we'll see but i understand that kind of uh, well i gotta no i there and again people aren't gonna like me like addressing commenters but this is an interactive show and i want to talk about it there's this guy in the chat saying you uh, with a, a handle of you know nothing saying the maps as presently constructed are a play-in contender I mean, here, here's the deal. As pre- So they're presently constructed on paper, and then here's where they are in the Western Conference. They are currently not in the play-in. So I understand why you would feel that way, but they're literally not in the play-in. So it's hard to make that argument when they have had so many guys hurt. And I'm just, I'm not, it, it's not that I'm disinterested in that thought. Um it's it's just like I want to be able to say, all right, here here's where we can go from here, and maybe they're right because they have had a little bit of a soft schedule. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna argue that whatsoever. Um, but it, it's it's something that I think is at least worth uh, uh, you know considering that you know as this, as the season goes on, they're going to be playing teams that decide to kind of pack it in. You know, it's just the way this goes. So uh, I can't seem to pin um, I can't seem to pin my own. Uh, comment in the chat about joining the next show it's driving me crazy that's what i'm doing there like, we go uh, i did it <laughs> did you no that's yeah. that's that's sh- oh. that that posts the con that posts the thing below the chat i don't oh. know what it is so oh, okay my bad anyway all right guys so we're gonna hop over to the next show real quick those of you who are listening on an audio stream uh go ahead and and uh we, we thank you for listening today be looking for the next stream in your feed probably monday afternoon those of you who are hanging out uh in the in the chat go ahead and hang out because i'll be right back josh do you have anything else no i think that's it uh i can't wait to i mean i can't wait to talk about the next game I get there. Oh. they're playing well all right, this has been Kirk Henderson and Josh Bow of Mavs Moneyball and Pod Maverick. Thanks so much for hanging out with us. We will be right back and go Mavs.